And we begin with new fallout on some major political stories from President-elect Trump's decision to shut down his charitable foundation to growing outrage in Israel over a U.N. Security Council resolution condemning its settlements. Good morning to you. Welcome to Happening Now. I'm John Scott, and welcome to you, Melissa Thank you Francis. so much. It's great to be back. I'm Melissa Francis, in today for Jenna Lee, President-elect Trump unleashing a series of tweets, complaining about criticism of his charitable foundation after he agreed to dissolve it. Mr. Trump also questioning the effectiveness of the United Nations, saying it's just a club where people talk and have a good time. That is amid rising tensions with our key Mideast ally over the president's decision to break with past practice and abstain in a Security Council vote to condemn Israeli settlements in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu blasting that move, which had our ambassador not using the U.S. veto power to block it. A top Israeli diplomat now claims that President Obama masterminded the vote and that he has clear evidence of the White House's role. This, as prominent Republicans accuse President Obama of betraying Israel. Wow, that's a lot. We have Team Fox coverage with John Huddy live in Jerusalem, but we begin with Peter Ducey live in West Palm Beach. So what did we just learn, Peter, about how the president-elect will be communicating with Americans from the White House? That the president-elect is going to keep signing into Twitter even after he is sworn in as president, John. The incoming press secretary, Sean Spicer, just told a Rhode Island affiliate, WPRI, that we should expect to see Mr. Trump expressing his thoughts 140 characters at a time, even after January 20th. Mr. Trump has been busy from Mar-a-Lago on the social network targeting President Obama and the United Nations. As for his predecessor, Mr. Trump doesn't think Mr. Obama should be claiming hypothetical victory of a third term, tweeting this. President Obama said, he thinks you would have won against me. He should say that, but I say no way. Jobs leaving, ISIS, O'Care, etc. The president-elect is also expressing frustration about that anti-Israel resolution that the United States sat by and let pass with another tweet. He says this, the United Nations has such great potential, but right now it is just a club for people to get together, talk, and have a good time. So sad. And there is apparently a lot more where that came from on Twitter for the next four to eight years. John. There's also a new appointment, a uh, key national security role been filled. Wh who's in the job there, Peter? It's Thomas Bossert, John. And Thomas Bossert is a veteran of the George W. Bush White House who's been a security consultant since. He's going to get the title of Assistant to the President on Homeland Security and Counterterrorism. And that is a big change because the transition team explains this. The role performed by a deputy National Security Advisor in the previous administration is being elevated and restored to its independent status alongside the National Security Advisor, a decision that reflects the unwavering commitment President-elect Trump has to the safety and security of the nation, its people, and territory. And here at Mar-a-Lago today, we're told the President-elect is going to be holding some high-level staff meetings. John. Busy day ahead, and it looks like a nice one for it. Peter Ducey. Thanks, Peter. Way before the U.S. failed to block a Security Council resolution condemning Israel, relations between President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu were strained and chilly at best. Now tensions are ratcheted up again as the Israeli ambassador claims the White House masterminded that vote. More team coverage now with John Huddy, live in Jerusalem. And John, what are Israeli officials saying about all of this today? Well, Melissa, I spoke with a senior Israeli official uh, a little while ago, not too long ago, who told me that they had personally seen sensitive, what was described as sensitive material and information proving without a doubt that uh, the Obama administration, that the U.S. was behind this resolution, as you just mentioned, that was voted on uh, by the U.N. on Friday. And that really remains the position of Prime Minister Netanyahu, who said basically the same thing over the weekend, that the U.S. was behind it, that the U.S. really pushed it forward. And as you mentioned, U.S. Ambassador, Israel's U.S. Ambassador Ron Dermer, who was on special report last night and added this. Listen. We have that evidence, and as I said earlier, we're going to present it to the new administration, and if they choose to share it with the American people, that'll be their choice. 
He didn't offer any specifics or really elaborate, and we're hoping to get maybe some specifics uh, and details a little bit later. But the fallout's already being seen here in Israel. Prime Minister Netanyahu has recalled uh, Israel's ambassadors to the countries that voted for the resolution, including the U.S. Of course, the U.S. US is uh, abstaining from that vote. And Prime Minister Netanyahu maintains that Israel will continue with its settlement policies even over the weekend, uh, possibly indicated that that Israel may even step up its settlement construction. He also said that Israel will reassess its ties with the United Nations. Melissa. Wow. Meanwhile, Ben Rhodes, uh, President Obama's Deputy National Security Advisor, he was on Israel's Channel 2 last yeah. night. Um, you know, it was quite right. an interview. Give us a little bit of what he had to say. Well, unsurprisingly, he defended the Obama administration, in particular um, the concern. He said that the Obama administration has raised concerns in the past about Israel's settlement policies, settlement construction, the effect that could have on peace talks and a two-state solution. And he also uh, added this. When we see uh, laws that aim to legalize outposts, when we see rhetoric that suggests that this is the most pro-settlement Israeli government history, and when we see the facts on the ground, again, deep into the West Bank, uh, beyond uh, the separation barrier, uh, we feel compelled uh, to speak up against those actions. Well, so far, we haven't heard uh, anything from Prime Minister Netanyahu today or any type of rebuttal to what uh, Mr. Rhodes said last night. Uh, but I can tell you this, Melissa, obviously this is uh, on the minds of many people here. It's part of the discussion in the coffee shops, restaurants, on the street. And I've asked people, what do you think about this? And they say, well, dismayed and disappointed, they're not surprised given the history between Prime Minister Netanyahu and also President Obama. Mm. Melissa. All right, a lot more to come, I'm sure. John, how do you thank you for that? So President-elect Trump is firing back at criticism over his charitable foundation, even as he announced he'll shut it down to avoid, quote, even the appearance of any conflict. Mr. Trump tweeting, I gave millions of dollars to DJT Foundation, raised or received millions more, all of which is given to charity, and media won't report. Joining, joining us now, Vince Colonnais, editor-in-chief of The Daily Caller. Is this a good move on his part, a necessary move, do you think? Well, I think so, especially because any president of the United States, or anybody with this much power, you know, the president of the United States, really should avoid any sort of scenario where you can have money coming in through a side door to a foundation that's in his name uh, in order to potentially influence the president of the United States. We saw this regularly during the campaign as a criticism directed at Hillary Clinton. She ran the State Department, and her Clinton Foundation took in money in many magnitudes higher than the Trump Foundation has ever taken in. And there were many, many allegations that people were uh, paying to play within the Obama administration. I mean, we can just look at one example. Hundreds of times, Clinton Foundation donors were given seats at White House state dinners. So there, there are very clear intersections between the government and that charity. And I think Donald Trump is looking to avoid getting into any sort of similar trap by having a foundation open while he's president. But he's not legally allowed to fully dissolve the thing yet, is he? Well, that's what they're saying. The lawyers are looking at this and suggesting that he can't legally fully dissolve it. But what he can do is the is the pragmatic thing, which is to essentially shutter it, decide like, hey, it's closed for business, I'm not going to be doing anything else with it, and all of those decisions he can make right away. The actual legal process of dissolving it is a technicality that, uh, that he may have to wait for, but for now, he can stop using the foundation as a charitable vehicle at all. So this uh, will avoid some of the accusations that uh, dogged Hillary Clinton, especially during her White House uh, campaign run, that, that she uh, was making uh, the Clinton Foundation open to people who may have wanted to curry favors with the Obama White House. Right, and in U.S. election law, foreigners, foreigners, for instance, can't give money to candidates. But the massive loophole that existed with Hillary Clinton is that she had this this uh, foundation, which was worth hundreds of millions of dollars, taking money from from foreign governments, from foreign people, from just individuals who were hoping to buy influence. Many of the John Podesta emails suggested that there was certainly influence peddling going on. So this all while she was in uh, one of the most powerful positions in the country as Secretary of State. So this is really, I think, a good opportunity for Donald Trump to close off uh, uh, what would be 
a massive side door for purchasing influence and say, I'm not going to allow that. Well, you know, he, he mentioned last week, I think it was, the fact that uh, she raised so much and spent so much more money during the election than he did, and, and he still won the office. A lot of those wealthy donors um, probably expected something in return from a Clinton White House. He doesn't have that litany of, of big money donors uh, uh, supporting his candidacy. Oh, that's right. I mean, normally after an election like this with so many big donors, you start s selling off the nicest ambassadorships to <laughs> your to the donors that you like. And we're not seeing that as much with Donald Trump, mostly because there aren't many wealthy donors to speak of. Tr truly, in, in a lot of ways, this was a grassroots campaign in terms of fundraising. Also, he didn't, as you mentioned, spend anywhere near the amount that she spent, mostly by diverting away from traditional forms of television advertising, things like that and focusing on, you know, simple simple fundraising and micro-targeting and being able to get right in front of the people that they wanted to get in front of. They were an efficient campaign and, in retrospect, looked very smart with uh, spending a little bit of money to get a lot of gain, which is, you know, to win the White House. At the same time, Democrats have been very critical of the Donald J. Trump Foundation, and, and even the uh, Attorney General of the state of New York is investigating how it raised and spent its money. Do you think that that criticism and maybe that investigation goes away as a result of the president-elect's decision to, to close the thing? Well, I think one of the reasons we even know the technicalities that he can't quite dissolve it right away is because it's under investigation. And I don't think the fervor with which Democrats uh, have been treating Donald Trump was just to say, we're always looking for lines of attack is going to diminish. I mean, Democrats clearly, and especially in this case, are going to be using any sort of handhold they can to suggest that Donald Trump isn't a good faith actor, that he's a con man, that he's something less than a uh, than a moral president. And by attacking the Trump Foundation, I think they think they they have a handhold, and I don't. I think that will continue, whether or not it continues to exist in, in any meaningful sense. Vince Colonnais, editor in chief at the Daily Caller. Vince, thanks. Thank you. Wall Street could break another record today as the Dow inches closer to the 20,000 mark coming up. We have a live report from the New York Stock Exchange on what could be the tipping point. And a blizzard closing roads and airports in the country's midsection where that snow could be heading next. Well, Wall Street is ta taking aim right now at another milestone. Investors watching to see whether the Dow breaks the 20,000 mark today. Pretty close, 19,961 right now. Fox Business Network's Nicole Petalides live at the New York Stock Exchange oh, with a look at the so possibilities. Much. Good morning to you all, sunny Good and yellow. Good morning. Good morning, right? Maybe we would have had some sunshine here on the market, but not exactly. It seems like we're so close because we are just less than 40 points away as we speak. However, we got within 20 points, and one trader actually used the phrase, Dow 20,000 is just toying with us. I mean, everybody is just waiting for it. Let me tell you what the traders are saying. The chatter here on the floor as you come in here this Monday morning waiting for Dow 20,000 again. First of all, the optimism continues. We've had seven weeks of gains for the Dow. Trump's policies are business friendly, job friendly, better tax rates. So they do think the optimism is there. Also that we will hit 20,000 in the near term. Will it be today? Will it be by the end of the year? Maybe in the new year, but I say that carefully, but we are going to hit 20,000. Also, we've seen the bank stocks soaring 20, 30 percent since the election, and it is a headline-driven market. Here are the leaders in the Dow since we hit 19,000. We hit 19,000 November 22nd. And now we're almost at 20,000. Here are your best performers. And you can see there are a lot of banks. Goldman Sachs, for example, up 14%. That added over 200 Dow points. JP Morgan Travelers, Boeing, United Health. Here's my last point that I want to bring to you. And that is the speed in which we're getting from 19,000 to 20,000. Do you know, it took two years to get from 18,000 to 19,000. And now it's 23 sessions, and we could beat out 1999 because they had they hit that milestone 24 sessions. So, John, we'll see whether or not we can break a few records here today, and that would be Dow 20,000 on the mark, and that would be huge. And then the speediness in which we see it, which would be 23 sessions from 19,000 to 24,000 to uh, 20,000. So we'll see if we can do that. I will note for the people who follow the Nasdaq. The Nasdaq hit 5,500 for the very first time today, and that in itself is a big deal. Big numbers are breaking out yes. all over. Good for the 401ks, IRAs. We like give it. it. Give us a shout if it hits that that uh, 20,000 mark. We'll get <laughs> you back on TV.
Thank Thanks, you. Nicole. A major winter storm leaving thousands without power in the northern plains. Whiteout conditions closing airports in North Dakota and causing flight delays at many others. Now the snow is moving east. Janice Dean is live in the Fox Weather Center to tell us which parts of the country could see severe weather. Janice, it is that time of year, right? Absolutely. And that storm, thankfully, that brought, you know, close to two feet of snow across the Dakotas is weakening and now pushing across the East Coast. You can see the warm air ahead of this. I mean, it's 56 right now in New York City, 20 in Minneapolis, so cold air behind it. And we've got a new storm we're going to be watching later this week. But look at the 24-hour temperature change, right? From this time yesterday, 19 degrees warmer, 32 degrees degrees warmer in Caribou, Maine, but that cold air is on the way. And then we've got warm air moving into the northwest. Now, last 24 hours, you see that sh showery activity pushing across the southeast. A little wintry mix for northern New England. Our next storm system on the heels of that pushing into the west, then across the Great Lakes. And we could be dealing with a nor'easter later on this week, Thursday, Friday. A little too warm, though. It's going to be mainly a coastal rain event. Interior sections, though, could get a big blockbuster storm uh, Thursday into Friday. So watching this very carefully. But New York, enjoy the warm temps. 58 is your daytime high, and then we'll get more seasonal throughout the work week. Back to you, Melissa. All right, talk to me about New Year's. That's oh. what people care about. What's right. it looking like? Here's, here it is. You know, I don't like to forecast too far in advance. We're forcing you. Uh, the temperature, not too bad. Okay, it's been much colder than 38 degrees at midnight. We could see some showers late in the game. I think we'll probably be okay at midnight for Kimberly and Eric Bowling, who are going to be out there, you know, enjoying the celebration. So I'll try to keep that rain away from Kimberly's beautiful hairdo. Uh, but there's your midnight <laughs> forecast. What about Eric's, Eric's too. beautiful hairdo? Eric's hair doesn't count for anything? He's got a lot of hair. It's very You're nice right. hair. You don't want to get it wet. You're absolutely right. I will keep the hair away from the hairdos from both Eric okay, and good. Kimberly. Rest of the cities look pretty good. Phoenix, you could see a few showers later on. Uh, looking good in Baltimore and Milwaukee and Pittsburgh. And looks like we could see some rain in Minneapolis and maybe Seattle. But not too bad. I don't see any places on the map that are really, really, really cold. And it doesn't look like we're going to have a big winter storm or anything in some of the big cities, including New York City. You're a good sport, Janice Dean, for going that far out. I know you don't like to do that. We it's appreciate okay. the preview. I will refine the Thank forecast. you, refine. Absolutely. Thank you, Janice Dean, the weather machine. We love it. John. And that wet confetti. It's oh, it's no good. Not good for No you. good. No. Investigators are trying to learn what caused a Russian military jet carrying 92 people to crash into the sea just after takeoff. Our next guest gives us his take as divers recover at least one of the black boxes. Plus, Congress making big plans to revamp our tax system, how it would affect workers at every income level, and your bottom line. A Fox News alert and search crews in Russia locating the flight recorder from a Russian military jet that crashed into the Black Sea this weekend. Investigators are now working to extract the data from the black box after it was found intact. All 92 people on that jet are presumed dead. Joining us now, Robert Mark, a commercial pilot and publisher of JetWine.com. Uh, that plane is, is sort of the Russian version of the 727, right? Three engines all in the rear. But how unusual is it for three engines to just fail at the same time? Three engines to go out at the same time within, you know, uh, 60, 80 seconds after takeoff is incredibly unusual. Uh, I mean, that means that it's probably going to turn out to be something like the fuel that would something that would have affected all three engines at the same time. There's, they are suggesting, as I understand from Russian media, they're suggesting that this was not terrorism. Can you rule that out that quickly? I don't know how they could possibly do that. I think it's way too early, uh, but what we do know is that the airplane wasn't very high in the air, maybe a thousand feet, John. I mean, and you know, a thousand feet when something happens, uh, you don't have a whole lot of time, and they were out over the water, and uh, they didn't have a sully event. Yeah. I mean, it, it potentially could have happened this, the same way if, if the pilots... Uh, had been able to pull off the, the kind of miracle on the Hudson landing that he pulled off 
uh, they, if they could have done that on the Black Sea, why do you suppose that wasn't apparently possible in this case? Well, the one thing that I haven't been able to verify yet is whether this happened in daylight or at, in, in the dark. Uh, in the daylight at, at that altitude, uh, it's it's really hard anyway. I mean, the, the Sully event on the Hudson was probably a one in a million. But if it was dark uh, or if, the, you know, it would have been virtually impossible to know where the water was in order to pull up in time. There are, um, it's been a bad week for Russian aviation. There have been a couple of fatal crashes in Russia involving Russian-made planes. And now there's uh, something called the Sukhoi Superjet, uh, which has been grounded by a Mexican airline because they found cracks in the fuselage. Overall, how would you assess the state of aviation there? Well, the, uh, if you look at the main airline, Aeroflot, years ago people didn't want to fly Aeroflot because they were flying airplanes like this 154 that crashed. But Aeroflot as an airline has, has upgraded. It's pretty much all an Airbus fleet these days. It's modern except for the Sukhois. Uh, the Sukhois are a relatively new uh, regional jet built, built in Russia. Uh, you know, we're going to have to do some investigating as far as the, these cracks go because there are other airlines that are flying these airplanes. I remember taking an Aeroflot flight in Siberia once. I was very happy to find that I was on board a Boeing 737, but that was some years yes. ago. Um, I, you have no, no, note my astonishment that you're flying Aeroflot. Well, it was, as I said, some time ago. So what about, uh, what about the lessons for American aviation? I mean, you know, we read about U.S. Uh, airlines trying to cut costs, trying to, you know, keep expenses very low so they can keep fares low. Are, are there parallels uh, between what's, what the Russians are experiencing and what some American companies are doing? Well, I, I think, you know, certainly in the U.S. we have an exemplary safety record, especially the last few years. Uh, where we've been seeing most of the accidents around the world, uh, they're happening in in areas where the you know the uh, technology is not quite as good. Look at that accident in Colombia last month. Uh, it's certainly, you know, it, it comes down to the crew crew training, to the technology, how well the airplanes are maintained, and we do a great job here in the U.S. Well, we absolutely do. Uh, I don't want that point to be lost on our viewers. Robert Mark from Jetwine.com. Thank you. Thanks, John. A new Washington Post op-ed claims the incoming Republican administration will hurt millions of low-income Americans. Why our next guest says Democrats may actually be the ones threatening the middle class. Plus, Sony dealing with another cyber attack after its Twitter account gets hacked. And the hackers thought it would be fun to spread a rumor about a superstar's death. Isn't that nice? What's next? Right now, it looks like crack, uh, hackers have cracked the code to Sony's Twitter account, spreading the fake news that Britney Spears had died. Well, her publicist quickly set the record straight, while Spears tweeted pictures of herself. For further proof, William Lajeunesse live in Los Angeles with more. How did this happen, William, and, and why Sony? I wish I knew, but, you know, considering how much Sony had spent on cybersecurity, John, after that embarrassing attack by North Korea about a year ago, I think we can assume someone there is probably in trouble. So this time it was Sony Music, not Sony Pictures, that got hacked. But the result is the same. When yesterday around 8 a.m., the official Sony Music site said Britney Spears had died. Rest in peace at Britney Spears, followed by a frown face, teary-eyed emoji, and the hashtag RIP Britney. Another tweet moments later said, Britney Spears is dead by accident. We will tell you more soon. That, of course, prompted her manager to immediately tell reporters Britney is alive and well, and the superstar herself tweeted out some photos about 19 hours ago showing she is indeed alive and well, but the damage was done. Sony had already paid out John $8 million for that data breach uh, for compromising information on their employees, 
And, uh, of course, they spent a lot of money on trying to fix their servers, apparently not well enough. John? North Korea comes to mind as a possible actor here. Who, who is to blame for this? Do we know? You know, I don't know if they're still mad about that, but uh, there is this collective of hackers called Our Mine. It is a very effective group that previously hacked the Internet accounts of the co-founder of Wikipedia, the creator of Pokemon, the CEO of Google. Not maliciously, they say, but to prove that an account is vulnerable, and then they sell their services. The Sony account uh, had been hacked, apparently, by Our Mine, and that may have been posted by the group itself, but later Sony indeed confirmed in its statement that it had been compromised and apologized to Britney and her fans. Bottom line, if you don't believe everything you read and hear, you can still go see Britney live in Las Vegas at and, her show. And young men thank everywhere you. are rejoicing this morning. William Elijah Ness. William, thank I think you. you're right. A headline from an opinion piece in the Washington Post catching our eye this morning. It reads, quote, the safety net is about to be tested. The op-ed reads in part, quote, poor Americans are facing the gravest threat to the federal safety net in decades as President-elect Donald Trump takes office accompanied by a Republican-controlled Congress. The risk to essential benefits for tens of millions of low- and moderate-income Americans include losing coverage extended to them by the Affordable Care Act, threats to the fundamental structure of the Medicaid health insurance program for the poor, and further reduction of already squeezed funding for scores of other important programs serving the most vulnerable Americans. So is that a fair critique of the GOP's plan? Let's bring in our legal panel. Here now is Hank Scheinkamp, former Democratic consultant for the Clinton-Gore campaign. And we have Jeannie Zeno. She's a political science professor at Iona College in New York. Thanks to both of you for joining us. Hank, let me start with you, because the sure. first piece of that assumes that the Affordable Care Act is ripped away and not replaced by anything. And, and no one's saying that's what's going to happen. Well, that's right. We need an alternative to the Affordable Care Act if it's going to be uh, taken apart or dealt with. And we need a way to ensure that people have affordable insurance, which, frankly, is diminishing every day. But more importantly, the constant talk about removing the safety net is likely to hurt the people who most, most significantly who voted for Donald Trump in the heartland, who are without, who need health insurance and who need Medicaid and depend on it. Yeah. Jeannie, I mean, is there talk about removing the safety net or, or is it in fact that when you look at the data that's provided by the Census Bureau, over the past eight years we've seen the gap between rich and poor get larger and larger. We've seen median income fall. We've seen stagnant wages in this country that, in fact, people have been driven towards this lower end over the past eight years. And that's really what is a threat to their income and their well-being. Yeah, I mean, in, a, in a, a month ago, Americans were asked to go to the polls, and you had a choice between a Democrat in Hillary Clinton and a Republican in Donald Trump. And people went knowing what they had experienced and endured under the, the last eight years. And so you talk about something like the Affordable Care Act. Nobody is seriously considering that it is going to be wiped away. Donald Trump himself said he is going to retain parts, and they are going to try to, quote-unquote, fix it. So... I, have, I do not believe for a second that they are going to be wiping away the social safety net. It simply won't happen. As Hank mentioned, the very people who voted for Donald Trump, he is not going to destroy the safety net that they need to live. But, but they are going to pull it back a little bit. And We do need growth. And, I mean, and we, we, and we need jobs we is need, what we need. But this is the essential what? argument, Hank, though, isn't it? I mean, it's the essential argument between are we supposed to be focused in addressing on with the system has already failed, no. so you have people who are in such desperate straits right. that they need this sort of aid. Or are we focused on the idea of jobs, that people want to work and earn an income and support their family right. and grow the economy, right. and that's where so much of the attention should be. If they're not mutually exclusive. You need the growth in the economy. 1.7% is not growth when you look at what the rest of the world is right. doing. Number one, number two, <clears throat> the, the uh, obsession with trade may very well reverberate to hurt the very people that uh, the administration's, the incoming administration has talked about helping, and did it with social services and the social safety net. How do you repair it? Well, they've got to come up with a plan. But if you listen to rhetoric over the last uh, several years in the Republican-controlled Senate, certainly taking apart Obamacare is what they call it, has been the talk, not what the replacement might be. And that is significantly important. And that is the challenge, of course, because it's easy to say when you look around at people that it's not working when you hear from people who are buying insurance that then nobody takes or they see their premiums and deductibles rise. At the same time, going in and, and fixing the system is the real challenge. I mean, are there signs that the Republicans have some ideas how to do that? 
It's a real challenge, but let's not forget, Bill Clinton himself came out before the election and said this thing needs to be fixed. Everybody agrees it needs to be fixed. And Republicans' challenge is going to be showing how they're going to fix it. But what we do know so far is at least the president-elect himself has said, we're not going to take away the good parts of the Affordable Care Act. We are going to repair it, and it's in desperate need of repair. And let's not forget, our social safety net is also in desperate need of repair. Nobody wants to talk about the tremendous problem we have in this country with entitlements. And right. that reform is essential or our economy won't grow to Hank's point and it desperately Ent needs to grow. Entitlements that benefit the rich, including reforming the tax code, would be a good start to this, number one. And number two, frankly, um, I want to meet the guy, the Republican, who's prepared to take on the insurance industry and say, by the way, guys, you've made a tremendous amount of money oh, over the last few years. I mean, if you look at the way Donald Trump has, has treat right. the company since he's got in. He's not afraid to say that. But let me challenge another point sure. that you've made, because you talk about the fact that the safety sure. net and growth are not mutually exclusive, not exclusive. But there are a lot of people that believe what creates that safety net, a, a huge tax environment and a lot of regulation. That's where you get the money to fund it. Sure. And that, in fact, curbs growth. So there are a lot of people out there that very much disagree with your there thought. There is a midpoint. You can have the safety net and you can have regulation and you can have Corporations not run, run around to do crazy things. And the reason why we have regulations is because corporations have abused their power. It's very simple. Look at the tax code. You want to start to fix this, go to the tax code first. Look at Medicare, figure out how, what rich people who are on Medicare are going to lose that benefit. Yeah, I mean, really. And, and, and in fact, that's one of Donald Trump's first thing that he wants to do mm -hmm. is reform the tax code, simplify the brackets. He wants to, um, you know, expand sure. the deductions so that Absolutely. more people don't itemize and we see few of those loopholes. I see everybody Good nodding. Idea. Is that the place to start? That is the place to start. And let's be clear, Americans elected a moderate Republican. This is not a conservative by any stretch of the imagination. And this is somebody whose experience is in business. So he's going to be doing exactly what you just said he promised he would do. At least he's going to be trying. The question is, how is the Republican Congress going to work with him? That's been the challenge for Republicans all along, is bringing this coalition this together. This op-ed reminds me of the right. trap that we fall into after every election, is that sure. one party stands up and says, look, we won, we've got this mandate, here's what we want to do, and the other party is sitting in the position of basically throwing tomatoes at, at the people that are up there trying to make a change for a while. Is that where the Democrats are relegated to, and how do they deal with that? Um, they're really not in the Senate. You have uh, Chuck Schumer, the incoming minority leader, who is a very smart pal, a very good compromiser and somebody can get deals done. What happens in the House? The House is a different kind of problem. You have old-style leadership that needed to be changed. The Democrats didn't do that. Guess what? More throwing tomatoes, more old ideas. Yeah. Donald Trump is not the Republican, however, that the Republicans wanted. How he gets people to take a real populist look at things instead of a, a kind of a bourbon Democrat look, which is very elitist, yeah. which who they've been, and change the system is going to be something else. Bourbon Democrat. I like that. All right. <laughs> Thanks to both of you. Appreciate it. John. We'll talk a little more about this. Congressional Republicans vow they will overhaul the tax system next year. Our next guest talks about how that could affect your family and why he says the plan might end up adding to the deficit. Plus, a beautiful sight in this Australian park. What caused waterfalls in the desert? Right now, a powerful rainstorm in Australia causing flash floods, closing the park where tourists come from all over the world to see the Ayers Rock landmark. Record rain also creating an indelible scene at the park, a series of waterfalls transforming that desert region as streams of water were pouring from the mountaintop. Rare and cool. So Republicans in Congress hoping to overhaul the tax system next year. It is a move that would affect Americans at every income level and in businesses big and small. Lawmakers haven't revamped the tax code in 30 years. How is that possible? House and Senate leaders promising new tax package will not add to the budget deficit. Hmm. Gene Marks is a Washington Post contributor. He is also a CPA who is the owner of the Marks Group PC, and he is a small business advocate. Sir, thank you so much for joining sure. us. You heard in the last segment, everybody said it all came down to dealing with the tax code first, yep. which is interesting. That's like doing your math, eating your broccoli. I know, out of the like game. which it's comes a, before right, him. It, it's a pain in the neck, but it's, it's essential. We heard 30 years is a long time. You know, a lot of I actually remember 
were do it last tax over a whole 30 years that ago, is which is really, yeah, yes. it is, it's so, <laughs> making me a little depressed right now. Um, individual rates will go down. That's one thing that you're saying out of the gate. And a lot of people thinking about that as we come to the end of the year here to three brackets maxing out at 33% corporate rates will go down. What does that mean? So what that means is, uh, first of all, none of this is decided. We don't know for this sure if this is going to happen. Right. right. But um, there's a lot of agreement in D.C. about this happening this year. And as a CPA, we're advising our clients to expect lower taxes next year. You're going to have lower taxes, and I'm going to have lower taxes next year. Right now, the top tax rate individually is 39.6%. So there is agreement between both Trump's plan and Ryan's plan as well, Paul Ryan in the House, um, to bring it down to a top rate of 33% for individuals, yeah. which is really great news. The, there, there was a, um, you know, sort of a, well, I guess it's, it's not a myth because it's true, but there mm. were people talking about the fact that some people's taxes could go up in the mm. new year. That would be a result of anticipating making more money. Yeah. So you could pay more tax, but net net, you will have more money to take home because that's built on the idea that the income is growing. They're also talking about the standard deduction increasing significantly. Right. And for some people, they might say, well, wait a second, you know, that sounds like we're giving everyone a free holiday, but that's about eliminating a lot of the loopholes are trying to get people to skip them, right? Sure. I mean, the, the whole, uh, you know, the, the whole hope is that we get all of our tax returns done onto a postcard. Remember you heard right. that promise being made? And uh, uh, again, as a CPA, I don't think I'd want that because right. that would really <laughs> limit my work. Uh, but uh, the standard deduction is something that we have the option of taking as opposed to itemizing our deductions. It's $6,300 for an individual, $12,600 for, for married couples. Um, making it bigger reduces the complexity because if you're going to do your tax returns at the end of the year rather than you know tiling up all of the itemized deductions and all the different things that you can do um, just say you know what why don't I just take the standard deductions as one line that's what it is makes it easier and the reason why they're proposing that is because as much as Congress and President-elect Trump wants to simplify the tax code they're leaving in some things out there that remains sort of complex. They're going to leave in the deduction for charities. They're going to leave in mortgage deductions. They're going to leave in a child care deduction, even a child care credit. So suddenly you're taking these things, you're taking like the tax code, we're going to simplify, 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 but now they're leaving some of these things in. So when you leave that door open, doesn't that sort of open up the door to more of these things? So the higher yeah. the standard deduction, the less complex the tax returns. So as soon as the plan gets rolled out, immediately the fighting begins yeah. over what the deficit is going to look like yeah. and how much more debt we're going to be. And one thing that drives me crazy is that when we do this math, it's very hard to anticipate going forward how much growth is going to be created as right. a result of lower taxes. We talk about static versus dynamic accounting, which means, like, are you assuming... The economy is going to grow by so much. Are you assuming the economy is going to be the same? This is where a lot of the fight comes down to. We don't, we don't really know the truth we until don't it happens. Know. And don't you find the same way? I mean, look, it's part of your job. You interview economists and people yeah. that are experts in this topic, and you can get 10 people in one room saying, well, if we make these assumptions, right. this is going to happen, and other 10 people are going to have the exact opposite view. Right now, between the, the House Republicans, their tax plan would increase the deficit over 10 years by 3 trillion dollars. That yeah. seems like a lot. However, Donald Trump's plan right now would increase the deficit by 10 trillion, by some estimates. Those are enormous numbers, particularly when our national debt right now is working on 20 trillion dollars. Yeah. Is that a good number? Is that a bad number? Is that manageable? There are some economists that say, listen, national debt is like your mortgage. If we can have maintenance on it, if the economy is growing and we can make the payments on it, it's okay to have big numbers. You'll have economists that disagree entirely. Right. That's going to be the biggest argument in Washington is we want all these tax deductions. Who's going to pay for it yeah. and whose assumptions make more sense? So I, I always love to get down to people who are in the trenches like yourself mm. that deal with taxes and stuff and setting aside the idea that if it's simpler, maybe that's less work and revenue for you. <laughs> What's your gut reaction? I don't think it will plans? be simpler. I don't think that no? it will be any less work for me. I think that um, as human beings, we are tend to make things more complex just to justify our own existence. So we'll start from one place like we did 30 years ago. Look what's happened in the past 30 years. The code has gotten more and more complex. There are too many special interests out there, Melissa, that are going to be arguing for their rights, their deductions, their credits, their incentives. So you're never going to have that sort of postcard tax return. It's always going to grow in simplicity. But I will tell you this much, taxes will go down next year. Yeah. So whether or not we believe how it's going to be funded or not, we will be paying less taxes next year, and let's hope that that actually contributes to growth. Let's hope that means growth, because when people have more money in their pocket, they, they feel it. better, they spend more, they, businesses invest, yep. maybe we'll see this economy take off. Thank you for your expertise. You got it. Thanks really for having me on. It. John. Well, it propelled us into World War II, and we just marked 75 years to the day since the attack on Pearl Harbor. Today, the Prime Minister of Japan makes a historic visit to that scene.
touring the memorial to the victims with President Obama. We're live with that story. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Let's check out what's ahead on Outnumbered at the top of the hour. Sandra and Kennedy, what do you have? Hey, John. Well, Israel's prime minister calls it a shameful ambush by the U.S. Its ambassador says it has evidence the Obama administration was behind it. What our historic move at the U.N. means for relations with our closest Mideast ally. And how will things change under President-elect Trump? All right. Plus, President Obama says if he could have run for a third term, of course he would have beaten Mr. Trump, who says no way. But who is right, we will discuss. On Twitter, of course. No, yes. All that plus our hashtag one lucky guy outnumbered. Top of the hour. Sounds good. good we'll to see watch. You. Thanks. Thank you. Right now, a historic visit by the Prime Minister of Japan as he becomes the first sitting Prime Minister to join a U.S. president at the Pearl Harbor Memorial on the USS Arizona. In a few hours, the two leaders will tour that haunting memorial. Kevin Cork, live at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii with an update. Kevin. John, always nice to talk to you, my friend. You're right. A very important day in terms of the historic relationship between these two allies. Uh, it is a day of reflection and obviously reconciliation as well as they mark the 75th anniversary of the events that propelled the United States into World War II in the Pacific. As you pointed out, it's the USS uh, Arizona Memorial right here at Pearl Harbor. That's where the two leaders will be. Of course, the Arizona felled by the brutal attack that fateful morning that cost the lives of so many on both sides of the war. It was, after all, December 7, 1941, as then President Roosevelt politically said, and so powerfully so, a date which will live in infamy, a day also marked by sacrifice, heroism, and the loss of life. This visit by Prime Minister Abe is actually the back end, John, of an earlier exchange at Hiroshima when President Obama marked the end of the war and the lingering effects of the first atomic bomb blast that struck that city. Uh, for the Japanese Prime Minister, this visit is also as much about the past as it is the future between our two countries. And that should be a promising future, says America's diplomat to Japan. I think the alliance is so strong uh, and it has so much bipartisan support. I think President Trump, I think that he'll recognize that. This is a day, by the way, John, where we will not only hear from both of the leaders, we'll also watch them take a tour of this solemn and hallowed ground. Uh, interesting, we also should uh, point out, we'll be talking about what this may mean for the future of U.S.-Japanese relations, including how President Trump President-elect Trump now, but soon to be President Trump, will view that relationship, in particular the security arrangement between our two countries. We'll talk about that later on, but for now, back to you. How things have changed in 75 years. Yes, indeed. The blink of an eye mm. in, in some respects. Kevin Cork. Kevin, thanks very much. So new in the next hour of happening now, more backlash over the United Nations anti-Israel resolution condemning settlements in the West Bank and East Jerusalem the role of the Obama White House played, and the impact it will have on U.S.-Israeli relations and the Mideast peace process. We're going to go in-depth. Brawls in malls across America, fights breaking out on the day after Christmas in several different states. Have you seen this? We are live with the story. I'm not ready Ooh. to say goodbye to 2016. It's been a good year. It has been a good year. I've really enjoyed it. You know, I've got a great idea. Why don't we come back in an hour? We'll do another hour of this. Right. We've still got some time before I, New Year's I, Eve. I've enjoyed having you here today, and I'll look okay. forward to the second hour, okay? Right. So see you back here then. Outnumbered starts right now.